Hello, and welcome to this presentation on asset protection planning. I am Jacob Stein. I have been practicing asset protection for about 25 years. We have done a few thousand transactions, and we represent everyone from uh, mom and pop uh, business owner owners who are facing some sort of financial hardship uh, to very, very wealthy uh, families who are looking for long-term asset protection. I think a good place to start this presentation will be to discuss under what circumstances are clients looking to protect their assets. And I will give you some uh, specific uh, examples uh, from the recent cases that we have handled. I'm gonna obviously change the facts ever so slightly to protect the identity of our clients. Uh, but I think these are very, very uh, representative and very uh, real cases. Um, so uh, a few examples, and I'll, I'll try to scatter them as much as possible to give you a very broad overview of when people engage in asset protection planning. Uh, so something that we see very, very frequently uh, will be uh, clients who have at some point in time signed a personal guarantee, and now their business is going through financial adversity, um, and uh, they're worried that the lender will call the personal guarantee. So for example, Right now, we are, we are representing uh, the owner of um, some very successful, prominent uh, restaurants uh, across the country. He did uh, sign personal guarantees on several of the leases for the restaurants, and they're still recovering from COVID. Uh, there's still a lot of money that's owed uh, to the landlords for the, for the restaurant space. And uh, nothing was happening during COVID. Uh, every, everyone was, I don't know, was either being nice or there were moratoriums in place. Uh, but in most places, these moratoriums have expired. And over the past, I would say, six months, we have been seeing a lot of lawsuits being brought against our clients, um, including this client, right? So the landlord now has filed the lawsuit. Um, it's about a million and a half uh, that is passed due uh, on, the, on the various lease payments. And again, the client has signed the personal guarantee. It appears to, legit, to be legitimate, valid. Uh, I doubt they will be able to challenge uh, the, the contractual agreement itself. Um, and the lender, if they do obtain a judgment against our client, will be able to go after his home and his uh, savings and so forth. And the new businesses he has started that are owned through different entities. So we're looking to protect his personal assets and his uh, new business investments, his new restaurants that, that he has launched. Uh, another common example are uh, business owners who have employees who are facing lawsuits from their employees. So, for example, in California, where I practice, we see this a lot. These are usually class action lawsuits or often are class action lawsuits against the employer for some sort of a wage and hour violations. Right. So they don't track meal breaks or they don't pay for overtime or what have you in some Enterprising plaintiff's law firm finds uh, one or two employees. They try to get a class together, or at least a bunch of these employees together and bring uh, a significant lawsuit against the employer. And uh, some of these uh, lawsuits may have personal exposure, depending on the laws of your state, for the people behind the business entity. So in those types of lawsuits, we are looking to both protect uh, the assets of the business itself, and also the assets of the business owner um, as well, or the family that owns the business. Um, another common type of clients that we see for asset protection is someone who is involved in some sort of catastrophic uh, automobile accident, um, usually with you know, very significant injuries. And these are people who, for whatever reason, do not have significant coverage, or at least significant enough to cover the damages from the accident. Uh, I often hear people say that, well, the insurance you buy has to somehow relate to your net worth. But that's really not true if you think about it, right? The insurance that you buy covers the risk. It has to be significant enough or substantial enough to cover the risk you may have uh, from uh, whatever accident or incident takes place. So whenever you have uh, some sort of catastrophic injuries, maybe even death, right? It's nothing to do with your net worth. It has to do with the injuries that were suffered by the plaintiff. Insurance coverage has to be sufficient to cover that. Uh, and very often we'll see clients who have 100,000, 300,000, 500,000 of insurance coverage, 
which is probably sufficient to cover, I don't know, 99% of accidents, but that 1%, right, can far exceed their insurance coverage. And again, they're seeking, um, they're seeking asset protection. Um, we have clients who are being investigated by various federal agencies or are worried that one day they will be investigated by a federal agency because they're in a high risk business. So, for example, we often represent people in the digital marketing space or in the telemarketing space uh, where there is some uh, significant uh, exposure and clients are worried about Federal Trade Commission investigating them or coming after them. Right. So there is some sort of uh, preemptive asset. Um, asset protection. Uh, I, I think that's good for now. It gives you a sort of a, a rounded, well-rounded overview when people seek asset protection. Yeah, and what's true about most of these cases is that they will fall into one of two categories. The first category, and this is the one where we would like to be in, these are clients who anticipate that something bad is going to happen to them, right? Some sort of a financial adversity is going to hit them. Um, so they will default on a loan at some point in time, right? Or they may get sued by a business partner or by their investors or by some agency or what have you, right? And they're planning ahead of time. And maybe none of that will happen. Maybe they're just being proactive. They're being uh, risk averse. They're being cautious. But that is the smartest time to plan, right? You plan ahead of time because when you plan ahead of time, as we'll discuss in a second, you can use much simpler structures that are a lot less expensive and they will have a much higher certain uh, probability of success, much more certainty that it will work. The second category of clients, and this is by far the largest category of clients, are those who plan after the fact, meaning something bad has already happened. They were already in a car accident. They already defaulted on their loan, right? They already got notice of a lawsuit. They got a letter that some agency is going to be investigating them. Um, and some of these are sort of early on, right? Some of them are call us after a lawsuit has been filed. Some clients call us after a judgment has been entered against them. That's how long they wait, right? Because the entire way through, they're hoping that somehow they will prevail, that somehow this bad thing that is happening to them is just going to go away. And often it doesn't, right? And then they're scrambling uh, for a last minute, a way of protecting their assets. So let's talk about uh, what we do in asset protection, what is possible, what is not. Um, and before we get into the slides, just uh, a couple of uh, uh, foundational topics that I think need to be covered to, to get us all into the same page. First of all, and I think most importantly, by far most importantly, what is our objective with asset protection planning? Like, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Um, and I would say that our objective with asset protection planning is often not to protect assets, which is surprising given what we call this area of the law, right? We call it asset protection. And, and that's how it started out. But nowadays, protecting assets is really not uh, what we are trying to accomplish. What we're trying to accomplish is placing our client into a better negotiating position, right? Because very often protecting assets is just not in the cards. So right now I am uh, speaking to a client uh, one of the spouses was involved in a very bad uh, car accident, um, and they're being sued for a very significant amount of money. And the, the, the most important asset that the clients have is their home. Um, there's just nothing that we can do to protect that home in a foolproof way, right? All of these structures we'll hear about later, like trusts or transferring assets to the other spouse, placing a lien on the property, all of those might work, you know, this late in the game, but there is a good probability that they will not, right? So then why do you engage in asset protection? Well, you engage in asset protection because if you can make it difficult enough and if you can make it expensive enough for the plaintiff to go after our client's assets, they will think twice about it. And in some cases, we will see that plaintiffs will just not pursue our clients at all. This happens approximately from our own sort of internal statistics about 30% of the time, which is not bad. And then in the remainder of the cases, the parties settle, right? And uh, now we're placing our client in a position when, where they can settle on much more uh, favorable terms. So, th so that's our objective. Um, so keep that in mind, right? We're not looking for a perfect structure. We are not looking 
just for a bulletproof way of protecting assets, uh, we are looking to set up obstacles, right? And we are looking to set up substantive obstacles, not just camouflage. Um, and, and on that topic of camouflage, asset protection, in my experience, is really not about hiding assets. I think it's op often associated with hiding assets. I don't believe that's a smart way to go because if you're hiding assets, uh, you're placing a client in a position where at some point in time, <clears throat> they will have to appear in the debtor's examination and they will have to answer, answer questions under penalty of perjury, right? And if they're simply hiding assets, they will now have to perjure themselves for that form of protection to work. So hiding assets is not bad if you make it difficult for plaintiffs to find the assets. Maybe they'll never bring the lawsuit or they'll be much more willing to settle. But you also want to combine it with some substantive protection. So substantive protection, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, what do we do to protect assets? Uh, well, there is no not one magic bullet structure of protecting assets, right? There are many different things that can be done to protect assets. Um, Probably, I would say, close to a couple dozen structures that we use routinely to protect our clients' assets with some iterations um, for each one. So a lot of different options. So how do we know when a particular client comes to us and you know they're seeking to protect their assets, how do we know uh, which structure to use for them, right? Are we going to use a trust or what kind of a trust, maybe domestic, offshore, what kind of a clever name is going to apply to this trust? Maybe an LLC is better. How do we get assets into the structures? Is it a gift? Is it the transfer for fair market value? Do we get other family members involved or, or is it a bad idea, right? So on and so forth. So we, in our practice, we go through this analysis and I've used these factors for over 20 years, right? And I've lectured about these for over 20 years now. Uh, really, this is the way we try to analyze every situation and figure out what is the structure that's going to make sense uh, for your client? And by the way, you know, you will see, um, especially on the internet, a lot of companies that sell asset protection and often they will sell like one particular or two particular structures. And if you see that my advice is run, right? Because it is uh, extremely unlikely that you will need precisely one of those structures that they're selling, right? Uh, an asset protection plan should be very customized to the client, right? There, there is no one size fits all approach here, right? For every client, depending on these factors, a, a different structure could make sense and a different way to implement that structure. So for example, we look at the identity of uh, the debtor, meaning who is our client? <clears throat> our risk averse is our client, right? I've had these conversations with clients literally I don't know, thousands of times over my career. And different people who may find themselves in pretty much the exact same set of circumstances may choose to pursue a very different course of action of protecting the same assets, right? Just because they have a different degree of risk adversity, different life experience, uh, let's say dealing with lawsuits, right? Uh, different tolerance for stress in their life, uh, different budgets to getting this stuff done. Um, so our client sort of mindset will influence greatly what it is they are and they're not willing to do. Where we see this most frequently is the client's um, willingness, first of all, to sell their residence or sell their real estate, if that is called for. A lot of our clients just do not want to part with their real estate, even if, from an asset protection standpoint, that's the best course of action. And we'll also see a lot of clients who are Let's say more reluctant to set up offshore structures just because they don't have a lot of experience doing anything overseas, maybe no experience doing anything overseas, right? So for them, it sounds a little scary um, and they need a bit more handhold. Uh, then we look at uh, the timing of the claim against client, meaning when are we setting up the asset protection structure? Are we setting up the asset protection structure before something bad has happened, you know, before there's anything even on the horizon, right? Or after something bad has happened. And if we're doing last minute asset protection planning, um, the structures have to be a lot more robust, a lot more aggressive for them to work because now plaintiff uh, may have a way of challenging what we have done. We need to examine whether uh, a bankruptcy filing 
uh, is a likely scenario for this client. Um, a bankruptcy sometimes may be the best course of action, right? Because it does give the client a fresh start, washes away all the all the debts and all the creditors. Um, asset protection does not give our clients uh, a fresh start, right? Uh, we cannot force the creditor to go away, right? We can place our client into a better negotiating position. Maybe we can make assets unreachable, maybe in some cases, right? But we cannot really force the creditor to walk away. The client still has to settle. They still have to pay the creditors something to give them incentive uh, to walk away. So, you know, if we're contemplating bankruptcy today or in the future, how we engage in asset protection planning changes drastically, right? Because what works outside of bankruptcy may not at all work in the context of a bankruptcy. Then we look at who is the creditor. And here, who the creditor is, you know, what is relevant to us is how motivated is this creditor to go after our client? Um, is there like a, a personal emotional component? Uh, maybe it's an ex-spouse or an ex-business partner coming after our client, right? And they will come after our client with a vengeance. Maybe it's some giant bureaucratic government agency coming after a client or some large bank or some plaintiff's law firm that maybe is great at litigating cases and getting judgments, but they don't have a lot of expertise in collecting on judgments, right? So we need to take into account how aggressively creditor is going to pursue our client, how diligent will be in their investigations of our client's assets, structures, the transactions he has engaged in, and that will vary uh, all across the board. Um, and then finally, and probably most importantly, I think, from a practical standpoint, what are the specific assets that we are looking to protect? Are we looking to protect liquid assets, right? That there is a certain uh, choice of structures of how we would protect liquid assets. And liquid assets, I mean, bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Um, are we looking to protect real property? And is it residential real property or income producing? Are we looking to protect retirement plans? Are they already exempt or do somehow do they need to be converted into exempt plans? Are we looking to protect uh, ownership interest in a business? Are we looking to protect the assets of a business? Because often asset protection planning is not for an individual, it's for a business entity. Um, intellectual property, collectibles, card, I mean, all these different uh, types of assets may have very different approaches as to how we look uh, to, uh, to protect them. Um, the one big obstacle, and by the way, I apologize, I'm gonna skip some of these slides just because in an hour long presentation, we don't have the time to go through every single slide and some of them I don't feel are as important as others. Um, and this is a slide deck that I have uh, for a full day presentation on asset protection. So in an hour, we're kind of skimming some slides and some slides we're skipping altogether. Um, but the, and this is a good time to bring up the following point. First of all, you do have the extensive uh, white paper on asset protection uh, that is available to you. Uh, if you didn't receive it, just reach out um, and we'll be happy to email it to you. And second, I am always available to those who have taken my uh, classes, watch my presentations. Uh, just sh shoot me an email. Um, I'm easy to find, just Google my name or you have my email address at the end of the slide deck, I believe. Uh, shoot me an email, say, Jacob, I, I took your class. I have this question or I have a client who's facing this situation. You know, what's your advice? Uh, always happy to help and uh, share some advice. I, I do believe in good karma, so uh, always happy to help. Okay, so uh, avoidable conveyances. Um, this is the one sort of significant most significant obstacle to asset protection planning. Um, if debtors were allowed to just do whatever they wanted with their assets, right? Uh, it is likely that very few plaintiffs would ever be able to collect any judgment, right? Because all you have to do is take the assets that you own and the plaintiff therefore can go after and make them into assets that you do not own and therefore a claim that cannot go after, right? Because they're now someone else's. And there's nothing a plaintiff can do about it, right? So we have this body of law that allows plaintiffs and creditors under cer certain circumstances uh, to pursue assets that have been transferred. And there are two types of tests and it's very important to distinguish, distinguish these two tests. So what do these tests give us? These tests allow a plaintiff to bring forth a lawsuit, a claim, 
and allege that a certain transfer of assets should be avoided, right? It should be set aside. And it's a lawsuit that's brought against the transferee, whoever's holding the assets, whoever is titled to the assets has to be uh, the target of this claim, the target of this lawsuit. And there are two ways to show that the transfer of the assets to this transferee uh, should be voidable. And the, so today, this is called avoidable conveyances for a long, long time. This used to be called fraudulent transfers. A couple of years ago, this body of law has been renamed, and they, they both in the Uniform Act and in most jurisdictions as well. Um, <clears throat> so voidable, and as the name implies, it's a conveyance, a transfer, right, that can be voided. Uh, there are two types. So first, uh, it's a transfer involving what's called actual intent to hinder, delay, defraud any creditor. And then there is a transfer involving constructive fraud. Um, so first of all, what is a transfer? For the purposes of this test, a transfer is anything that the debtor does that somehow diminishes the value of the debtor's assets to the creditor, somehow makes it more difficult for the creditor to collect, right? So it's an extremely broad definition, right? It doesn't need to be a transfer of assets, right? As we would think of that word transfer, like moving assets from one person to another person. That is obviously included, but what is also included in the definition of transfer for the purposes of this test is any action that the debtor takes that diminishes the value of the debtor's assets to the creditor. So for example, if you own assets through a limited liability company and to bolster the protection of the LLC, you decide to amend the operating agreement, that is a transfer if amending the LLC agreement makes it more difficult for creditors to get at the LLC's assets. So super broad definition. Once we have a transfer, now we look at whether this transfer falls into one of these two categories. Yeah, what is the intention behind the transfer, right? Why did the debtor transfer uh, her assets? <laughs> uh, and it's difficult to figure out why someone did what they did, right? Because their intention is buried inside their head, right? We don't know why someone does something, but we can infer it from the circumstances surrounding the transfer. So we look at what are called badges of fraud. This is indicia of intent. So we look at the timing of the transfer, right? Was this a transfer of assets a week before the car accident or a week after the car accident, right? And if it's a week after the accident, obviously uh, there is a good chance that the accident motivated the transfer of the assets. Uh, who were the assets transferred to? Were the assets transferred uh, into a trust that the data controls? Were the assets transferred to a, a close family member? Was this a transfer that was hidden? Uh, there are lots of different badges of fraud. Uh, most jurisdictions use at least 10, uh, but there could be more. Uh, and the two most important badges of fraud, and this is also uh, the elements of the second test, is a transfer <clears throat> that is for a less than fair market value, meaning there is a gift element to the transfer, um, and the transfer leaves the debtor insolvent. Um, so either the debtor already insolvent at the time of the transfer or as a result of the transfer, the debtor becomes insolvent. So for the first test, the actual intent test, we have to prove intention. For the second test, what's called constructive fraud, intention is irrelevant. Anytime you have a transfer that is for less than fair market value and it leaves the debtor insolvent, you have a your fraudulent trans, you have your avoidable conveyance, as it's called now. I still call it fraudulent transfer sometimes. Um, so this is how a plaintiff most often will attack uh, an asset protection structure. But this is not the only way. There is another way a plaintiff can attack uh, an asset protection structure, and that's by trying to pierce the corporate veil of the structure, right? Arguing alter ego. And that can apply both to trusts and to LLCs. And if we have time, maybe we can discuss it um, a little bit later. What I'd like to say about avoidable conveyances is uh, two things. One, <clears throat> as an advisor, right, if you're an attorney or an accountant advising a client, you need to be very careful, right? You do not want to knowingly advise a client to engage in avoidable conveyance because that may run afoul of the ethics rules. Uh, so that's number one. And second, it may expose you to liability, right? Some sort of vicarious liability for helping somebody hide their assets or protect their assets. So please be very careful doing this. Um, second, we, if we are worried that a plaintiff at some point in time will bring a lawsuit um, 
for avoidable conveyance, we should plan for that, right? We should try to set up structures that will give our client really good defenses against avoidable conveyance arguments. So maybe transfers for fair market value uh, would be a great idea. It eliminates the most important badge of fraud and knocks out the constructive fraud um, <clears throat> uh, cause of action. But another important thing to consider here, um, going sort of in a completely opposite direction is, what happens if our client does engage in what is later determined uh, avoidable conveyance? So for, first of all, understand the avoidable conveyances do not just arise so spontaneously, right? Someone has to bring a claim that it's avoidable conveyance and then they need to prevail on the claim. So nothing is avoidable conveyance unless it is argued as such and the judge decides that it's such, right? So until then, it's just a transfer of assets. Um, and everyone is welcome to transfer their assets. They can transfer their assets. It's just going to be a question of how effective it will be, right? So one way plaintiff can make a transfer of assets ineffective is by arguing that it's avoidable conveyance. So for a debtor, what is the analysis here, right? So very often we will see clients who are facing some sort of a lawsuit uh, that will wipe them out entirely. Right? It's just something catastrophic that has happened. Um, and they're so significantly imposed, uh, exposed, sorry, so significantly exposed that they will be completely wiped out financially. For a client like that, like forget about the lawyer, forget about the, the advisor, but for that client himself, is there a downside in trying to protect his assets? Because the worst that can happen is it's not going to work. It's going to be avoidable conveyance right? Uh, the plaintiff will be able to reach the transferred assets, but why not try? Because if they don't try, they, if they don't try, 100% chance the plaintiff will get at those assets. But if the client tries to protect his assets, maybe the plaintiff will never bring that voidable conveyance lawsuit. It's actually not that often that this happens. And even if they bring a voidable conveyance lawsuit, there's no guarantee they will be successful, right? Those can be defended. Um, so this is part of the analysis, right? I, I'm not saying, hey, go and knowingly engage in fraudulent transfers or avoidable conveyances. You should not. But for a debtor, like if you're in a position where, hey, I'm going to lose everything that I have, everything that I spent my entire life working for, I think a lot of people are going to look at this and say, who cares? If I do nothing, I'm going to lose everything that I have. So I'm going to try to do everything that I can to keep as much as I can. So just food for thought. Um, Okay, so let's uh, start getting into the substance of uh, planning options. And we'll go through some of them uh, fairly quickly. Some of them we'll spend a bit more time on. So first, planning in the context of marriage. So if we have a married couple and only one of them is exposed to risk or one of them is being sued, how does that affect the other spouse? Well, it turns out it doesn't affect the other spouse per se, right? Uh, let's say the husband is being sued. It's nothing to do with the wife. And the fact that they're married doesn't change it, right? Uh, you're not liable uh, for your spouse's debts. Um, but the question will be, what are the assets? What are the assets um, that the plaintiff will be able to go after? Well, in here, it depends uh, on which state you live in. So if you live in a common law state, um, which is the majority of the of U.S. states, uh, so using the English common law, um, each spouse has their own separate property, right? Uh, and the separate property of the wife, in my example, is not going to be exposed to the lawsuit against the husband, right? So the husband's creditors can go only after his assets. They would not be able to go after the wife's uh, assets. It's nothing to do with the husband. In the community property states, right? So these are the former Spanish territories for the most part. I think they're, what, 12, 13 community property states, something like that in the West. In the community property state, we do have this concept of community property. Community property is deemed to be owned by each spouse 100%, what's called the coextensive ownership interest. And because each spouse is deemed to own it 100%, um, when either spouse is being sued, all of the community property assets are exposed to that lawsuit, right? So when we talk about, oh, community property is owned 50-50, that is not true. It is divided 50-50. Uh, 
it is owned 100 100 percent um so what sort of planning do we do uh, in the context of marriage well it's similar for both common law states and community property states if the husband is being sued we try to get assets uh to the wife uh in a community property state we will try to sever community property which in many community property states you can do with an agreement terminate community property create separate property of the husband create separate property of the wife and then we try to do some you know thinking about which assets should go into whose uh, bucket of assets uh, but it's very very common uh, to see only one spouse being sued right especially if it's a tort claim like a car accident or even a personal guarantee very often just one spouse uh, signs the personal guarantee to the lender or to the landlord, right? So then what assets can be moved and should move to the other spouse is our uh, analysis. Uh, divorce may also be uh, an option here. Uh, divorce by itself is not some sort of a magic shield uh, against creditors. But when we transfer assets on a divorce, so long as it's an equal split of assets, it becomes incredibly difficult, not impossible, but incredibly difficult uh, for a plaintiff to argue that the split, the transfer of assets person to divorce is a fraudulent transfer. So getting into kind of meatier structures and these are structures that apply uh, across the board, uh, a structure that we see very often uh, used to protect assets would be a limited liability company. So why? And why not a corporation, right? So corporations are great in a lot of ways, and uh, most notably corporations are great at protecting us from any uh, risks and liabilities that arise within the business of the corporation, right? So we had uh, uh, a client recently we represented, they operate a chain of tire stores uh, across the, the country, uh, and they very frequently face product liability lawsuits. And all these lawsuits are directed against the corporate entity that runs the business. You know, it's a very large, viable uh, entity. No plaintiff has been able to pierce the corporate veil of that entity, nor should they be able to, right? And the individuals behind the corporation, the shareholders, right, uh, are protected uh, by the corporate veil of the corporation. The same is true when you are a shareholder in a publicly traded company, right? If you own shares in Tesla, right? And tomorrow Tesla start exploding on the freeway, you as a shareholder do not have any personal uh, liability, right? Only that corporate entity faces uh, the lawsuits. Um, so LLCs uh, give us the same liability protection when the lawsuit, uh, when the claim is against the entity itself, right? So whether Tesla is a corporation or an LLC, I mean, obviously LLCs can be public companies, but that's irrelevant for our discussion. It's the legal entity itself that is going to be sued, right? And the lawsuit is against that legal entity. It's not against the owners of the entity. And the LLCs in this respect may be... Uh, a bit advantageous, uh, in my experience, over corporations, especially for uh, closely held, uh, like family entities, right? Closely held business entities. Uh, because one way that a plaintiff can try to pierce the corporate veil of the corporation is by arguing that the corporation is failing to maintain its corporate formalities. So like the annual, let's say, minutes and meetings. With a limited liability company, there is no requirement to have formalities, right? So we're taking uh, an argument away from the plaintiff and making it somewhat more difficult for them to pierce the corporate veil of an LLC. But really where the LLC shines <laughs> is when the individual owners are being sued, right? So when a shareholder of a corporation is being sued, and this is something we see uh, all the time. So right now, for example, we are representing owners of a law firm uh, and the, the attorneys go in the law firm. And they're facing a very significant uh, tort claim unrelated to their law practice, right? It's against them personally. Uh, and they're very worried that uh, the plaintiff is going to go after their interests in the law corporation. They will put a, a receiver into the corporation to do what's called the tilt tap, right? So to take the checks as they come in, um, uh, maybe get an assignment of the receivables uh, to the plaintiff, right? And all of that is possible because their law practice is organized as a corporation. Uh, and any 
anytime you own shares of stock in any corporation, whether it's a public company or a closely held corporation, a plaintiff can get what's called a turnover order and get the shares in the corporation turned over from the debtor to the plaintiff, to the creditor. And now they own the corporation. They control it. They get the underlying assets, including the ability to liquidate the corporation. With a limited liability company, that's very different. With a limited liability company, uh, there is no, uh, usually as a general rule, there's no way to get a turnover order, right? And the vast majority of jurisdictions, uh, a creditor cannot get the ownership interest in the LLC from the debtor. All they can get is what's called the charging order. And the charging order is a lien uh, that is placed on the debtor's LLC interest. And this lien works uh, kind of like a wage garnishment. So if the LLC makes distributions, they now have to go to the plaintiff. It's a much better place to be in, right? Because if the plaintiff only gets money out of the LLC, if the LLC makes distributions, and if our client is in control of this LLC, guess what's going to happen, right? No more distributions. Um, and the plaintiff most likely cannot force, at least in most states, the plaintiff will not be able to force uh, the LLC member or the manager of the LLC uh, to start making distributions, right? Because with LLCs, by statute, um, the creditor does not acquire voting and management rights. So we strongly prefer LLCs to corporations for asset protection. I realize that LLCs are not always possible, right? So if you, in many states, if you have a professional corporation or professional practice, you cannot be a limited liability company. It has to be a corporation or a limited liability partnership. <clears throat> if you're planning on going public sometime soon, right? You want it to be a C Corp and not an LLC. Uh, but most businesses can be structured as limited liability companies. Um, and sometimes it just makes a lot of sense. Um, where we don't really care about how the entity is structured is when it's a service business and there's really nothing in the service business for a plaintiff to go after, right? The income goes in, gets distributed out, and that's it. Um, so we, we're really focusing here on legal entities that own significant assets, right? Uh, these entities, we definitely want to organize as LLCs. And then if the business does have some significant exposure, right, to, you know, you know exposure to employees, uh, exposure to product liability losses, exposure to what have you. And the business also has some significant assets. Uh, it could make sense to set up a couple of different entities, right? So you can have one entity that will own the assets and the other entity that will run the operating business. Uh, we very frequently, for example, do this with intellectual property, which for larger businesses is usually or often their um, most significant asset. Um, so... Uh, the IP will be owned, let's say, by a limited liability company, and it will be licensed to the operating business. So if there's a lawsuit against the operating business, the plaintiff cannot take uh, the IP. Okay, moving on to trusts. Um, moving on to trusts. And trusts really are the cornerstone of assets. I mean, th th this is the most important building block of asset protection planning. Well, why is that? So all asset protection planning, you know, whatever we do, again, as I said, there are a lot of different structures, but every asset protection structure aims to accomplish pretty much the same thing. Every asset protection structure aims to take an asset that the debtor owns and make it into an asset that the debtor does not own, right? Because if you own something, a plaintiff can take it from you, if you do not own something, a plaintiff cannot take it from you, right? So every single asset protection structure aims to accomplish the exact same thing. Take the debtor's assets and transfer it to someone else. So uh, if our client is worried about being sued and the client transfers as, you know, let's say an apartment building into a limited liability company, well, okay, so he no longer owns that apartment building but he does own something else, right? He now owns that limited liability company. So there's still an asset on the financial statement. The plaintiff's attorney is still excited about bringing forth the lawsuit, trying to pierce the corporate bail of the LLC or somehow get around it. Um, so the LLC are, you know, gives us some level of protection, but not as much as we would like. 
A trust goes an extra step because once we transfer an asset into a trust, uh, the asset comes off our client's financial statement. He just doesn't own it anymore. It is not his asset. And believe me, from a negotiating standpoint, that is a much better position to be in, right? Being able to say, here's my financial statement, and there are practically no assets on this financial statement. I'm judgment proof. Let's settle for what I'm offering, right? So what kind of trust uh, will allow us to get to this uh, result? So uh, only an irrevocable trust. If the if our client has the ability to revoke the trust, if our client has any ability to get at the assets of the trust, right, to, to get the benefit of the assets of the trust, the creditor can step into his shoes. Anytime you have the right to get a benefit from the trust, right, creditor steps into your shoes. So if you're a set lawyer and you have the right to revoke the trust, which is the right to take your assets back out of the trust, obviously that's a right that runs to your benefit, a creditor can step into your shoes and force you to do that. Um, with the revocable trust, there is not even a need to do that because in every single state, there is a statute that will say that creditors are allowed to go directly after assets that are titled in a trust that is revocable. So every asset protection trust is irrevocable. And that word irrevocable, let's spend a couple of minutes on it because it can be scary if you don't have a lot of experience uh, in, in this practice area. So when I went to law school a couple of years ago, um, irrevocable was, you know, it was a word that had some finality to it, right? When you, you set up an irrevocable trust and you transfer assets to this uh, irrevocable trust, it would mean that you cannot change the trust, right? You cannot be amended. You can't take your assets back out, right? You cannot revoke it. You cannot terminate the trust early, right? Uh, it's a done deal. It's cast in stone. You've committed to it, right? You can't go back. And uh, clients are often uh, reluctant to do that because it's so difficult to plan for the future for how things may change in the future, right? Today, we have these beneficiaries. What do we have a falling out? What do we want to change our beneficiaries later on, right? Today, this is how the law is, whether it's tax law or the local trust laws. So this is how we drafted the trust. The more the laws change, we want to change the trust, right? Uh, to account for these changing laws, I mean, so on and so forth. Our needs may change as the time goes. Today, we have these priorities and objectives, and tomorrow it can be something else. And the revocable trust, historically, did not allow us to do that. It's a done deal. You sort of jump in with both feet, and you see where you land. Um, fortunately, today, that is not the case. While we can still draft that old-fashioned irrevocable trust, there is no need to. Nowadays, we can draft an irrevocable trust, which will be irrevocable as far as third-party creditors are concerned, but would not be irrevocable as far as our client is concerned. And we can draft an irrevocable trust that will allow our client uh, to retain significant uh, degree of control, whether it's directly or indirectly. Usually indirectly is the best way to go. Uh, if directly, it has to be very, very limited. So usually indirect control over uh, the ability to terminate the trust, change beneficiaries, change the trustee, change the governing law, uh, and so on and so forth. So irrevocable is not as scary as it used to be, right? Um, and we draft probably close to 100 irrevocable trusts every single year. Been doing it for many, many, many years within hundreds of these trusts and have yet to see any client, any one client, have a problem with the fact that the trust is irrevocable. So that, that's how much irrevocable trusts have evolved, I would say, over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, we do want to make sure that the trust has a spendthrift provision, right? So the beneficiary uh, cannot anticipate distributions. They cannot assign their interest in the trust. Uh, and I think that's uh, pretty much a boilerplate in every trust agreement nowadays. And then we want the trust to be as discretionary as possible meaning we're giving the trustee uh, a lot of power when it comes to making distributions, okay? Um, the more power the trustee has, uh, the more tenuous the beneficiary's interest in the trust and the more tenuous the beneficiary's interest, uh, you know, that reduces the creditor's ability to go after the assets of the trust. As a matter of fact, 
if the trust is fully, fully discretionary, meaning the trustee gets to decide when to make a distribution, how much to distribute, and most importantly, which beneficiaries to distribute to, uh, then beneficiaries do not have a present property right in the trust. All they have is a mere expectancy. And, and that's not something a creditor can go after, right? Because they may get something from the trust, they might not. Um, so that's all good and well. Here is an interesting one. Self-settled trusts. So historically, historically, um, coming down from the English common law, you could not set up a trust for your own benefit and have that trust be an effective asset protection shield, right? So you can set up a self-settled trust. It's valid. It's just not an asset protection shield. Um, and that's still the law in the vast majority of states. I think in about 35 states or so, that is still the law. But there are approximately 15, and I haven't counted recently, so maybe that has increased a bit. It's, let's say 15 to 20 states, where you can now set up what's called the self-settled trust as an effective asset protection shield. So let's explore what self-settled means. Self-settled means that you have set up a trust and you have transferred assets into that trust for your own benefit, right? You are the beneficiary of your own trust. And that benefit can be the full benefit of the assets of the trust, meaning like you are the only beneficiary. Or it could be that you retain some small interest in the trust, like the right to receive, uh, you know, $100 a year from the trust. To whatever extent you've retained uh, an interest in the trust, uh, to that extent, the trust is deemed self-settled. And to that extent, the trust carries no asset protection in the majority of the state. Um, but let's make this more interesting. There are states, right, where self-settled trusts now work. Uh, I think this started in about 1997 in Alaska, and then a bunch of other states followed suit, right? So let's say in Alaska, you can now uh, set up a trust for your own benefit. Um, and it's an effective credit shield. So... Um, is it a good idea to go to Alaska virtually, right? Don't go there in person, it's cold. But to set up an Alaska trust, you know, hire a local trust company uh, and uh, transfer assets to this trust. It may not be a bad idea in some cases, but be mindful of the following. First of all, if you have a self-settled trust and you file bankruptcy, there is a 10 year look back on transfers of assets to a self settled trust, right? So, they extend the statute of limitations, usually for avoidable conveyances. The statute of limitations is only four years. But if it's, to, if it's a transfer to a self settled trust, it's extended to 10 years. And guess what? In bankruptcy, if the trust is self settled to any extent, the entire trust is treated as a self settled trust, not only the benefit that you get for yourself. Uh, so I think for a lawyer setting up self-settled trusts for clients in the context of asset protection could be malpractice because you never know when a client may have to file for bankruptcy protection, right? And you don't want to create this very long-term uh, look-back period on transfers. Second, uh, what if your client does not live in Alaska? I mean, the odds are like 99.9% .9 that your client does not live in Alaska, Um but there, as I said, there are a lot of states, uh, although, although none, none of the big states have these self-settled trust rules. But let's say you, you try, your client doesn't live in Wyoming or Nevada or Delaware or one of these many other states that have allowed uh, the use of self-settled trusts, or sometimes they're called domestic asset protection trusts. Um, you know, why, you know, would it work if your client does not live in one of these jurisdictions? Well, let's say that your client lives in California, right? And he transferred his assets to uh, an Alaska trust. The client is being sued in California for whatever reason they're being sued and the lawsuit is proceeding under California law. And the plaintiff gets a judgment against the client in California and they, oh, they find that the assets have been transferred into an Alaska trust. First of all, is a California judge bound by the choice of law in the trust instrument. It turns out they are not, right? The choice of law we make in the trust instrument 
similar to the choice of law we make in, in an LLC agreement or a shareholders agreement or a partnership agreement that is only binding on the parties to that agreement, right? So it's only binding on LLC members. It's only binding to the, on the parties to the trust, so the settlor, the trustee, and the beneficiaries. The choice of law in the trust agreement under the choice of law doctrine is not binding on third-party creditors. So just because you say you have an Alaska trust does not mean that Alaska law has to apply. So what a California court is going to do to decide which law is it proper to apply is they're going to look, they'll do like a holistic uh, review of the trust to see, you know, where is the trustee of the trust? Where are the assets of the trust? Where are the beneficiaries of the trust? Does the trust actually have some sort of a substantive collect, uh, connection to Alaska to justify applying uh, Alaska law? And if they do not find that there is a substantive connection to Alaska, uh, they will apply California law and then California uh, self-settled trust would not work. So understand, I have nothing against Alaska, Nevada, Delaware, what have you, Wyoming trusts. Uh, they can be absolutely great. We do grab them from time to time. But you have to look at your client and you need to figure out, is this the right approach? Um, you know, it used to be when this legislation was enacted that when we drafted these irrevocable trusts, they were cast in stone. And so I could understand back then why people were so driven to set up these irrevocable trusts for their own benefit. Because even if circumstances change, you're still the beneficiary of your own trust, right? So no harm, no foul. Today, there is no need to do that, right? Today, we can draft irrevocable trust that can be unwound, that can be changed, or it can change the beneficiaries. So I don't think there is really this need for self-settled trust today. And given their disadvantages, given the likelihood that they will not work if your client lives in a different state, um, I would not recommend using them, and I personally do not use these trusts, except in some rare uh, exceptions. The trusts that I do use often, and just uh, structures that I use often, are offshore structures. Uh, and I'm not one of these people who will sell you an offshore structure for whatever ails you. I don't believe there is such a thing, right? Again, as I said, there has to be a very customized approach and a solution for every single client. And when I, I will tell you that when I started practicing law, I was not a huge believer in offshore structures. You know, we used to set up uh, foreign trusts. It was maybe five, 10 percent of our practice. Um, and I used to lecture about them a lot. And I would say, yeah, you know, for the right client, the right circumstances, it, it's a good solution. But don't try to use an offshore trust uh, in, in every set of circumstances. And that's still true, right? We still would not use an offshore trust under any circumstances. But what the past 20 some years of experience have taught me is just how truly effective these offshore structures are in the right set of circumstances. So what's, a, what's an offshore trust, a foreign trust? Well, it's simply a trust that is, is, that is established under the laws of a foreign jurisdiction and it's being administered in that jurisdiction, right? So for example, we set up trusts a lot in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We used to set up a lot of trusts in the Cook Islands. We sometimes will set up trusts in some of the European countries. Uh, and we are not only like uh, stating in the trust that the governing law of the trust is the law of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We will actually hire a trust company to be a trustee of the trust. And this trust company is in St. Vincent, right? So the trust is being administered there. So that's all well and good. So first of all, why do we use these jurisdictions? And then under what circumstances do they work like really, really well? Um, so we use specific jurisdictions that have uh, modified and modernized their trust laws to make them much more asset protection friendly. So these jurisdictions uh, like St. Vincent, for example, I like it a lot, uh, will make it extremely difficult for any creditor to pierce a St. Vincent trust. Uh, they will not recognize a use judgment if it pertains specifically to St. Vincent trust. Um, they have a very short statute of limitations on fraudulent transfers. They require the proof of a fraudulent transfer beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, there is a, a automatic flight provision built into their laws. I mean, there are all kinds of goodies that they pack into their laws to make themselves debtor friendly. Um, so we, lo we look for jurisdictions uh, like that. Um, but these jurisdictions um, only work 
when assets can be placed outside the United States, right? So if uh, we set up an offshore trust and this offshore trust will own real estate in the United States, it doesn't do us that much good, right? Because if, if it's real estate in the United States, does a U.S. judge care that it's titled in the name of some foreign trust? If he really thinks this real estate should go to the plaintiff, he will make it so, right? He will transfer the real estate uh, to the plaintiff, uh, sign a judicial deed or something else, right? Help the plaintiff maybe get at that real estate. We only use foreign trusts, at least in our practice, right? In our practice, we use foreign trusts only for liquid assets, assets that themselves can be placed beyond the jurisdiction of a U.S. court, right? Fungible assets. They're here today. They're in Europe tomorrow. So when we're setting up offshore structures, and by the way, foreign trust is just one of the examples of offshore structures. Uh, there are many other types of offshore structures, um, and many different jurisdictions sort of to pick through. So, but there are a couple of things we're looking for. First of all, we want two different jurisdictions to be present. <clears throat> one is the jurisdiction of the structure, and one is the jurisdiction of the money, right? So for example, if we are setting up a trust in St. Vincent, we don't want banking in St. Vincent, right? We want banking in, in let's say, Switzerland. Um, so we want the plaintiff to kind of pursue the money through as many jurisdictions uh, uh, as possible. So, uh, but it has to be liquid assets, right? Um, and then when, wherever the assets go, we have a strong preference to locate the physical asset itself, again, titled in some sort of an offshore structure, but to locate the physical asset itself in a jurisdiction that will not recognize a U.S. judgment. So in years past, we didn't really have significant access to this uh, because we didn't really want to locate a lot of wealth in the Cook Islands or in St. Vincent or what have you. But there are now, uh, we now have access to European jurisdictions, uh, European Union countries that will not recognize U.S. judgments, that will not enforce service of process from the United States, um, it will not make discovery available, right? So that's where we want the assets to go. So maybe the trust is in St. Vincent and the money goes to one of these uh, European uh, countries. Uh, just a quick note, uh, when you do have offshore structures, there are almost always uh, all sorts of reporting requirements either to the IRS or to the U.S. Treasury. So foreign trusts have uh, certain reporting requirements. They have their own tax returns effectively with their own like due dates that need to be filed. Uh, these are forms 3520 and 3520A. Um, if you have foreign bank or investment accounts, right, those are subject to FinCEN reporting requirements. If you have a controlling interest in foreign entities, those have a, like a special form that's attached to your tax return that needs to be reported. So all sorts of uh, different reporting uh, uh, requirements apply. <clears throat> Very quickly, just uh, on uh, retirement plans. Uh, so for asset protection purposes, there are two types of retirement plans. So you have your risk of qualified plans. So these are your uh, 401k plans, defined benefit plans, profit sharing plans, and the like. These plans are often uh, exempt from credit claims under federal law. So what you look for is, you know, is the plan qualified under ERISA, right? Uh, and second, who are the plan participants? And ERISA anti-alienation clause will apply if the plan has employees participating in it. And these must be employees who are either not the owners of the business and not a spouse of one of the owners, right? So all the other employees count and we need to have just one employee participating in the plan for ERISA protection to attach. And it's an absolute bar uh, against credit claims. Um, if you have a plan that's not ERISA qualified, so it's called a non-qualified plan, uh, whether it's protected uh, depends on the state you live in. So a mo the most common example of a non-qualified plan will be an IRA, but there are others, you know, these so-called rabbi trusts and you know, keo plans and whatnot. So you have to look at the laws of your state and some states like, let's say, Florida, New York, and Texas, uh, IRAs will be exempt. Um, and in some states like California, they will use subjective standards to determine if IRAs are exempt. Um, in some states, I think like Nevada, there's a dollar limitation on how much will be exempt and so forth. So you just have to review the laws uh, of your particular state. Um, we don't have time really to get into this comprehensive um, uh, example. 
it is described in the outline, and you're always welcome to reach out to me with uh, with questions. Um, again, I'm always happy to answer questions, and I realize that in an hour presentation, we sort of skim the surface. We cannot get into a lot of the details. So if something was not clear, if you'd like me to expand on any topic, um, uh, I, I'm happy to do so. Uh, there is my email address, uh, jstein at alianplot.com. You can just also Google my name. I'm not difficult to find. Again, shoot me an email. Happy to answer questions. And with that, thank you so much for listening to this presentation on asset protection planning. And I'll see you guys next time.